Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Christ Baptist Church. If you go ahead and stand, we'll join each other in worship. You can take out a hymnal and turn to hymn 157. 157. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would He devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature sin. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. All right, if you'll flip over to 334. 334. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. Divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, 
this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Please be seated. Well, good evening. I spoke, had a nice little conversation, I don't know, what, Monday night? What, this day's Wednesday, right? Or Tuesday, I'm not sure which. Monday with Rock. And life is good. I asked him if the boys had been out in the pond in front of the house. He said, he laughed. He said, oh, yeah. And he said, and I forgot, he said, one of them shot their first armadillo. I said, life is good. <laughs> said, life is good when a boy can shoot an armadillo. Beloved turn Indians. He said, send his love, miss y'all. They plan on coming to visit sometime in the near future. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we will begin in verse 18 through 25 tonight. And when you get to that portion of the sacred scriptures, stand with me as we read from the Holy Word of God. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Lord, thank you for the wisdom of God that laid out the plan of our salvation in Jesus Christ at Calvary. Thank you for the foolishness, Lord God, of the message of the cross. In your name we pray. Amen. In Job chapter 28, Job asked a very important question in verse 12. Where shall wisdom be found? Now the book of Job is, Job is considered one of the wisdom literature books. Job was a wise man. And then in the remaining portion of that chapter of 28 of Job, he begins a search for it. He searches to the depths of the earth. And the depths of the earth personified says, it's not with me. He searches to the depths of the sea. And again, the sea personified said, it's not with me. He speaks about its value. <clears throat> Can't be purchased with gold or silver or other precious stones or metals. And then death and destruction are personified. And they say, we've heard reports about it. And then Job gets to verse 23. And he says, as God understands its ways, and he knows its place. In other words, he knows understanding, he knows wisdom, he knows its place. And finally, in the very last verse of the 28th chapter of Job, he declares what the wisdom of God is. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13 says, Happy is the man that finds wisdom, and the man that gets wisdom understanding. In tonight's message, we're going to see a similar search for wisdom that we see in the 28th chapter of Job. If you haven't picked up on it, in verses 18 through 25, the word wisdom is mentioned 11 times, if I added correctly. That's a dead giveaway about what we're talking about tonight, a dead giveaway. This is a new paragraph, but it's not a new subject matter. It may appear to be a new subject matter, but it really isn't. Paul's continuing to unravel the problems. That he's just really beginning to unravel the problems at Corinth, like you peel the, 
peel the skin off an onion, you just keep peeling, you keep peeling. And one of the layers of the onions, which was an underlying layer of the division, was worldly wisdom. They were smarter than they thought they really were. You know, there were some who favored Paul. We saw that last week. I'm of a Paul. And that there was a natural inclination to migrate to him. He was the founder of this church. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some favored Apollos. There would have been a natural migration towards him because he was, from what we gather, a very eloquent speaker. He would have fit right into wisdom and literature and understanding and, and speaking. He would have been the, the eloquent preacher of the New Testament. And he became their pastor after Paul, which would have a natural tendency towards him. But by the way, it was Paul that chose him to be their pastor, so that reveals to us there were no schisms between Paul and Paulus. And then there were some who chose Peter. Peter was most definitely the least educated, but he was also the most outspoken. He was the leader of the tw twelve. He was recognized by the Jews. He was a great man used of God. He would have been the choice of those Jewish individuals at the church at Corinth. The subject matter hasn't changed. He's dealing with division in the church. Division that comes because men, as my grandmother used to say, want to be too big for their britches. She told me that a couple times. I didn't know what that meant. I finally figured it out. Corinth was the perfect location and place for division that would occur out of the schemes of wisdom because it was only 50 miles from Athens. 50 miles, that's not far. That's about here to Nashville, North Nashville. Athens was the center of education at that time. It was the center for learning. It was the center for philosophical thought. In Paul's day, it was the center of, of learning throughout the whole world. They, they did nothing but talk about the origins of man, and they wrangled day in and day out amongst themselves. The Greeks loved to talk about a whole lot of nothing. And Corinth was so close to them that they were not knee-deep in the search for wisdom, the talk of wisdom. They were neck-deep into it, and it was the perfect place for it. They were a sophisticated bunch of people. Philosophies, beloved, invent views about mankind that are completely contrary to what God, how God views mankind. They, uh, they, they, they specialize in having no absolute standards because absolutes tend to uh, make us feel guilty. In philosophy, man's wisdom is an attempt to work around guilt and shame and sin. No absolutes, no right, no wrong. That's, that's the creati creativity of, uh, of the human mind and the human heart. Worldly philosophy always runs counter to God's wisdom, always. And it always runs into a roadblock with God's word and God's wisdom. So you have to make a choice. Do I do as the world tells me to do? Do I do as the world says I ought to do? Or do I do as what the Word of God says I ought to do? There will hardly be a time in which worldly wisdom ever lines up with God's wisdom. Hardly. There will hardly be a day in which believers do not wrestle with what the world says versus what God's Word says. When human philosophy is imposed, God's wisdom is deposed. Unknown author, but that's so true. The Corinthians highly valued wisdom. They highly valued eloquence in speech. They were enamored by intellectual abilities and lofty words. And they forgot about the simplicity of the cross. That's usually what happens when we get enamored by intellect and philosophy. In these verses that we have tonight, we see a lot of contrast. But the biggest contrast that you're going to see is a contrast between the world and the word, between wisdom, man's wisdom, and God's wisdom. Job asks, where shall wisdom be found? And Paul answers the question here, at the cross. 
The cross is the heart of the gospel. The, the cross is the theme of Christianity. To Paul, the cross was the supreme expression of God's wisdom. Division will always occur at a church when we think up, conjure up, develop our own schemes and replace it with God's wisdom and replace it with God's cross. Tonight I've got a three-point outline. I want you to see the word, the word of the cross in verse 18. The wisdom of the cross in verses 19 and 20. And the witness of the cross in verses 21 through 25. The word of the cross, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. First contrast is, is made here between this verse and the previous verse. Here it's between the word or the message of the cross and the wisdom of words, verse 17. Beloved, I want you to see that the word of the cross is a simple message. It is a simple message. This word, this, this word, word, <laughs> or message, depending on your version, is the Greek word logos. And it, 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 it refers to speech. The New American Standard really captures the meaning here when it says not in cleverness of speech, not in how you say it. Paul is putting down clever, educated, rhetoric, sophisticated speech. He's emphasizing the content of preaching, not the art of it. The content. When he preached, he presented the cross in plain, simple words. He didn't hide behind beautiful verbiage. He, it was just simple talk. A simple message for simple people. Keep in mind who we're talking about here. The Apostle Paul. Educated. Well versed in the Old Testament scriptures. Very well acquainted with Jewish heritage. He was one. A scholar of scholars in his day. And yet he says, keep it simple. It's about Calvary. Keep it simple. It's not about me. It's about the cross. Beloved, there's a real problem amongst some preachers of the gospel who weigh the significance of their message based on the beautiful spoken words that they say. There's a real problem when the speaker is more concerned about the compliments that he gets after the message versus the conviction of the Holy Spirit that the message might bring. There's a real problem when a preacher becomes a phrase monger and overwhelms people, the audience, with his vocabulary and eloquence to impress them. I can think of one preacher in mind who is no longer fit to be a preacher. It concerns, it concerns me when the preacher is more concerned about his approval rating than the Lord's approval rating. Listen to what Simon J. Kistemarker said. Even the most ungodly men can appreciate eloquence and good oratory skills, whether he believes the message or not. But it is not the will of God that his servants should tickle the ears of his hearers, but through the simple preaching of the cross, they would stir the conscience of men with the gospel. What is inspired is not the preacher, but what he's preaching, the Word of God. As Paul left Athens, just 50 miles away, he was defeated and he was discouraged. And no doubt as he's walking, leaving that city headed to Corinth, he's thinking about how it went there. It didn't go well there. And he knows he's going into Corinth where the people are almost similar to the Athenians. And he determined as he went there, not that he, he wasn't determined to keep it simple in Athens, but he determined when he went to Corinth that he was going to keep this message very simple. That it wasn't going to be based on human uh, uh, persuasion. Beloved, the message is never about the messenger. It, the message is about the message of the cross. Beloved, we're not to preach. I'm not to preach. You're not to teach. We're not to witness. To win admir ad admiration of people. That's not our goal. Our goal is not to, is to win, the, win them in the awe of the cross. In God's wisdom. 
that they may be new, be found new creations in him. To be full of oneself and a golden tongue orator is the opposite of being empty of oneself. Beloved, you may, and I, you may win a lot of converts with good persuasive words, but you're not winning converts to yourself. You're winning converts to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. That is the word of the cross. It's a simple message. Secondly, it's a saving message. Verse 18. Look at verse 18. In one verse, Paul tells us that humanity is divided into two categories. Notice the contrast here. There are those who are perishing. Look at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But the contrast, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There are those who are perishing and then those who are being saved. There are those who view, view the gospel as foolishness and there are those who view the gospel as the power of God. You see the contrast? And in that eternal scheme of things, God's design, there are only two kinds of people. Those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Those who are lost and those who have experience the gift of salvation. The lost are perishing. It means to fully destroy, to be lost eternally, to be lost forever. Notice it says are perishing. They are in the process of being lost forever. If you are living without Jesus Christ right now, you are in the process of perishing. The Bible does not say that you're going to perish. It says you are already perishing. There will be a future date of perishing when it comes to a fruition, when it's done, when there's no turning back. But right now you're in the process. If you reject the message of the cross, you're on the road to utter ruin. If you devised your own means of salvation, your wisdom, you're perishing. And then we have the saved, the saved to deliver, to protect, to heal, to preserve, to make whole. It was by no accident that Jesus asked the paralytic in John chapter 5, do you want to be made whole? He didn't ask him, do you want to be healed? Of course he wanted to be healed. Jesus had something far more in, in store. He wanted not just to heal him physically, but to heal him spiritually. Do you want to be made whole? It says being saved. In this past tense, for by the grace of God you have been saved. By his mercy, he has saved us. By the washing, the regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is always past tense, but salvation is also present tense as well. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ amongst those who are being saved. Second Corinthians chapter. Of course, his future tense. How much more shall we be saved, Paul asked in Romans chapter 5. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has everlasting life. That's present tense. And shall not come into judgment. That's future tense. But has passed, passed from death into life. That's past tense and future tense. Jesus speaks of all three tenses of salvation in one verse. John chapter 5, verse 24. Believers are saved during their life here on earth, but they're also saved throughout their life as the pilgrimage of this life goes on. And that's what brings us assurance of salvation. We're on our way. Just as you are on your way in the process of perishing apart from Christ, you are on your way to a final day of salvation to enter the presence of God. The lost, they're perishing because they view the gospel as foolishness, silliness, absurd, utterly stupid, folly. The lost look at the cross and think, what a stupid message that is. And they also look at people like me and perhaps people like you and think, what morons are they? Because that's what the word foolish is, it's moron. 
The saved are saved because they view the gospel as the power of God unto salvation. The cross is the force of God that we are saved by. God's plan of salvation was determined by his wisdom in the word, the message of the cross. If the message is not of your life right now, you're perishing. You're in the process of perishing. The word of the cross. Secondly, the wisdom of the cross. Verses 19 through 21. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? First of all, notice the fallacy of man's wisdom. To sure up his argument, and Paul frequently, all the biblical writers did it, but Paul, especially Paul, to sure up his argument of what he's just said in the previous verse, he goes to the Old Testament. And here he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14. When Isaiah spoke this prophecy, and it's found in 2 Kings, uh, expect, the, the background of it is found in 2 Kings 17. When Isaiah spoke this prophecy, he was referring to the shrewdness of Judea's leaders. They were concerned about an Assyrian invasion, so they sought the aid of Egypt. It's amazing how often Israel always went back to Egypt. They wanted, they couldn't, they couldn't get out quick enough, but as soon as they got out, they thought, oh wow, we've missed, we're missing out on the good food they had there. They forgot they were slaves. But they always go back to Egypt. They were seeking the aid of Egypt because they were afraid of Syria, and in doing this, they so they, so, they made Syria so mad, or so, Syria or Assyria, they made Syria so mad that Syria would have had attacked. They went after them. They showed up with 185,000 warriors. And Isaiah goes to King Hezekiah and says, don't raise an arm, don't raise a military, don't do anything. God will take care of you. God was proven he's going to turn the, the shrewdness and the utter foolishness of the politicians of that day he was going to show them what his wisdom was about. Human wisdom always wants to solve our own problems without God. Human wisdom has an answer for all of our ailments, ignoring God. Human wisdom is elevated so that we, we don't have to admit our need for God. Human wisdom elevates our reasoning so we can eliminate God the cross represents pain and suffering and humiliation and shame and weakness is God's message of wisdom to the world the crucifixion was the death of criminals and slaves it was repugnant in that day it was it was rugged cross yet of that day like we sing in our hymnals or have on stained glass windows or on our Lord's Supper table or on our jewelry. The early beginnings of Christianity looked fairly disastrous and in defeat because of the stigma of the cross. And if you were a preacher of the gospel, you were held in contempt. Beloved, the cross is not part of our message. It is all of our message. It is the only message that we have. It shows the power of God that is the power of God's love is greater than man's hatred. It shows the wisdom of God to bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. All human wisdom that fails to take God into account will fail. It will come to nothing, as he says. God will nullify it with his wisdom. Now, whereas verse 19 was a quote from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 20 is a quote from Isaiah 19 and also Isaiah 33. Paul asks sarcastically several questions here. He says, where is the wise? This refers to the Greek scholars of that day. Remember, he just came out of Athens. Athens influenced Corinth. And he says, he looks around, she says, would you show me where the wise are at? Where are they? Where is the scribe? 
This definitely refers to the Jewish scholars of the day. They were, in the Jewish circles, what the, the, what the, the, the wise was in the Greek culture. And then he says, where is the disputer of this age? Again, this refers back to the Greeks who were very fond of arguing back and forth, what, debating with one another. This was a person who had an answer for every question, had a response always ready. Do you know what these three categories, wise, scribe, and disputer, all have in common? They perceive themselves as being experts. As my grandmother would say, they're too smart for their britches. They made it their goal in life to search for truth, and, but the truth was only through their lens of understanding. It, did, it, it completely ignored what the scripture said. They made it their goal in life to be perceived as experts in their subject field. And if anything that said in the scriptures did not line up with what they said, they were skeptical and they outright denied it, and they outright attacked it. And the cross does not line up, intellectually speaking, to the wisdom of the world. It's rejected. In the next paragraph, verse 26, Paul's going to inform us of what we already know. He says there's not many wise that are called. We know that. We're not going to get but there's not many wise that are called. There's something about the mentality of those who regard themselves as wise and learn that makes them liable for self-deception and hostile to God's word. Could this not be more fitting than what we see today in the world? I mean, think about it. Psychologists have a diagnosis for everything that's wrong with us personally. I guarantee you I could find something wrong with every one of you with American Psychology book. Every one of you got something wrong. You all got a quirk. Sociologists tell us everything's wrong with society. Economic, economics people tell us everything's wrong with the mess in our economy. Scientists tell it how it, how it came about and how it's going to end. Historians tell us how history should be rewritten. And politicians just tell us what we want to hear. But Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that mankind suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. He doesn't want to hear the truth. I don't know if you ever did this. Probably to a sibling. I didn't have one so I couldn't do it. I'm not going to listen to you. No, no, I'm not going to listen to you. I can't hear a word you're saying. I refuse to listen. You ever do that? That's what. That's the image of suppressing the truth of righteousness. I do not want to hear what you have to say, God. Therefore, it says they did not glorify God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise. They became fools, and the result is a God gave them up to uncleanness, God gave them up to vile passions. God gave them up to a debased mind. Man's wisdom is flawed and it is seen in the way he lives. Paul comes to this fourth question. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And the answer is yes. Human wisdom can sometimes see the problem, but it refuses to acknowledge the root of the problem. Jeremiah cut to the chase on the root of the problem. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Can never be accepted by the world. The soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. Can never be of a true and loving God, according to the wisdom of the world. The fallacy of man's wisdom. Secondly, I want you to see the futility of man's wisdom in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message or the word preached to save those who believe. 
The word for and since, these conjunctions give us the explanation of why things are this way. It was by God's predetermined counsel, His purpose to establish salvation through the cross. Through His wisdom, He purposely made sure that you could not come to saving faith through your wisdom. He purposed that way. He would not allow you to come your way. Instead, he chose the only way, which was the foolishness of the message preached to those who have believed. Message preached. Again, talking about the content that is proclaimed. The emphasis here is again on the message and not the messenger. It is a focus on what is being preached and not the one who is preaching. God in his sovereign wisdom divinely purposed that mankind could not be saved through schemes that he makes up in his own mind. God in his sovereign wisdom purposely chose that mankind could only be saved through the foolishness of preaching. In the eyes of men, preaching about a crucified Savior is stupid. But in the eyes of God, preaching about a crucified Savior is a masterpiece of divine wisdom. It's the message we have. The word of the cross. The wisdom of the cross. Now I want you to see in verses 22 through 25, the witness of the cross. For the Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In this verse, we see that there are only two kinds of people found in the world. Lost and saved. We've already seen that. But also we see in these verses there are only two kind of nationalities found in the Bible. Jews and Greeks. Greeks being Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. As far as I can tell, we're all Gentiles. Paul chose these two divisions of the world to prove his point about the wisdom of the cross. You're either a Jew looking for a sign of the coming Messiah, or you are a Greek, a Gentile, attempting to make your own way of salvation through your way of figuring it out, through your schemes, through your wisdom, through your smarts. The cross puts all of mankind on the same level playing field. The Jews wanted something that they could see. The Greeks wanted something that they could understand. And Paul says the message is Christ crucified. And there are three responses here to the message, Christ crucified. And it's the same three responses that we see today. The Jews, it says, stumbled over this message. The picture is one walking down a path, and they catch their foot, and they stumbled over it. They were stumbling over the message of a cross, a Roman cross, that their Messiah would be hanging on. It was a stumbling block. This word here is scandalion. It's a scandal to them. This whole Jesus thing was a scandal 2,000 years ago, and it's still a scandal to the Jews today. Mention Jesus Christ to an Orthodox Jew and watch his response. It won't be favorable. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Even a reference to a person that would hang on a tree that could be a propitiation for sin is offensive to the Jews. Calling a crucified man the Christ, the Messiah, is the height of spiritual insensitivity to them and hypocrisy. They stumbled over it. Still stumble today. And they will stumble until the very day when they see the Lord Jesus Christ and they weep over him whom they have pierced. They will realize it then in those final days. 
the Jews stumbled over this message. The Greeks scoffed at this message. To the Greeks, foolishness. Again, the Greeks refer to Gentiles. The idea of proclaiming a message that a person who was nailed to a cross to a tree makes no sense at all. If there was a God, how wise could that God be by nailing his own son to the cross and that would be enough as a propitiation for sin to make us right with him? That is absolute utter foolishness, nonsense. It is a belief system of the weak. It is religious folly to the world that we live in. The Jews said, give us a sign and we will believe. Is that, is that not what they so, said to Jesus? Give us a sign. Give us a sign. I'll give you no sign. But then he turned around and gave them a sign, the sign of Jonah. They didn't get it. The Greeks said, give us some insight and we will believe. And yet when Paul attempted to contend with the Athenians, they did not want insight. They scoffed at him. They laughed him out of town. Nothing's changed. Jews are still looking for the Christ, the Messiah. The Gentiles are in, that's us in this world. They're still looking for the wisdom. All roads lead to God. You have your way. I have my way to God. If I live a good life, and in the end, God weighs my good and my bad, and my good outweighs my bad, I'll be saved. That's the wisdom of the world. And God says, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, therein is a way of death. Mm -mm. There's a third response, though. The Jews stumbled. The Greeks scoffed. And I want you to see the third response here. Verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The called submit themselves to the message of Christ crucified. They submit themselves to the word of the cross. The called are those who believe. Verse 21. The called are those who are elect and chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, according to 1 Peter. The called are those who are predestined, justified, and glorified, according to Paul. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Three responses. Stumbling, scoffing, or accepting. Those who are called once saw the cross as weakness, but now they see it as power. Those who are called once saw the cross as foolishness, but now they see it. God's wisdom. Once saw the weakness, feebleness, is now stronger, forceful than men. Beloved, when a person bows the knee to Jesus Christ, he begins to taste the power of God. He begins to see how it works in his life, how it operates. He begins to see how it transforms his life from light from darkness to light. He, see, he begins to see how he becomes a new creation in Christ. And he begins to see the process of old things passing away and new things coming to life. He begins to see the manifestation of Christ crucified in his life. You cannot possibly understand that. Immediately, all of it, the moment you're saved. But as you walk with Christ and you gain some years, you begin to understand it more fully. The gospel's best defense is not what you know in words, but that the word has known you and it's known by the way you live out your life. Whatever arguments that might come to you that you may not be able to dispute. One argument you can always win in it's the argument of a transformed life. No one can out argue that one. You may not be good with wisdom of words, not many are. But your life 
shows the transforming power of Jesus Christ. And that cannot be argued against. You may be a simple person, but the wisdom of God manifests in your life in a transformed life shows deep wisdom and understanding of God. Simple people, simple message, transformed, reveals the wisdom of God to this world. Lord, thank you for tonight. I don't think, Lord Jesus, anyone could adequately preach about the wisdom of God and not feel foolish. I don't think we fully understand the wisdom of God this side of eternity. I don't think we fully grab a full grasp, understanding, or how it operates in our life this side of, of heaven. But the taste of it that we get and what we can see, the foretaste of glory divine, oh Lord Jesus, oh Lord God, just makes me wonder how much more there'll be, how much greater understanding we'll gain when we meet you face to face. Lord, the wisdom of this world, foolishness to you, fools, many people. It's a way that seems right, but in the end it leads to destruction. And we may not think that we're very wise, but when we create our own way of salvation, our own understanding, we're making our own wisdom. And God says, you're foolish. Oh, Lord God, allow us to see the foolishness of the cross is the only means of salvation. The only way of salvation. And the cross is the wisdom of God unto all who believe. Thank you, Lord. For in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you Wednesday night. See you Sunday morning.